Hello, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of this presentation is to explore the theme in John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, and specifically we're going to look at this idea of loneliness and isolation and how it plays out in the different characters. The first place that we see this is in the ranch itself and the whole concept of itinerant workers. The idea of itinerant means going from place to place and not actually having any kind of permanence, which is this type of loneliness and isolation. We learned that the ranch itself is really isolated. Remember, George and Lenny have this long walk. The bus driver won't even go all the way to the door. And in case you didn't catch it, the words, this, the town's name is Soldad, which is Spanish for lonely or loneliness. And the location of the story never changes. We hear about some other people leaving. Uh, George goes into town once at one point. Other people go back and forth. But the reader never leaves the point of view of the ranch. From the time George and Lenny get there, everything else takes place at the ranch until that last scene again where they're back in the woods. The boss is even suspicious when he sees George and Lenny come in. And he says most workers are loners. He says, i never seen one guy take so much trouble for another. So we're really getting the sense that this is an unusual thing that George and Lenny have a friendship. Remember, the boss is so suspicious at one point, he suspects that George is actually using Lenny and stealing his paycheck and his money for, from him once the boss realizes that Lenny isn't very smart. And these workers seem to have no connections. When they get to the bunkhouse and the guy who had George's bunk beforehand, Candy says he just quit, just wanted to move, like they just get up and leave. And we also see George tell Lenny, though, that guys like us, that is this kind of itinerant workers, are the loneliest guys in the world with no family and nothing to look forward to. And Slim, again, also remarks on how unusual it is that George and Lenny do seem to have a buddy, that how rare it is to see guys traveling together and being friends. So the very setting of the story and this idea of ranch workers being itinerant place to place helps to establish this theme of loneliness and isolation. And then we're introduced to the character of Candy, who adds another level to this, idea, to this idea of loneliness and separation. Candy is old. He's so old in a, in a time when there was no social security, there were no retirement homes, and he has no family. His dog is his only friend and his only family that he has. He says, I've had him since he was a pup and that he used to be the best damn sheepdog I ever seen. So we have this sense that Candy had this connection, but that's all that he has. That's all that he's managed to hang on to. And the other guys just see the dog as a nuisance. They have no relationship with the dog. They don't necessarily wish the dog harm, but the dog is just this thing, and this thing is ugly, and it's smelly, and they just want it gone. So he, Candy, that is, allows Carlson to go ahead and take the dog out back and to shoot it. But he realizes later on that this was a mistake, that he shouldn't have let a stranger shoot his dog just because the dog was, was a bother. Instead, it should have been that him. He was the one that had the responsibility for the dog. He's the one that had the relationship with the dog. And if he had shot the dog, he would have been shooting the dog out of a sense of love and responsibility, not just out of a sense of literally taking out the trash. He offers to join George and Lenny's dream. He says, I ain't got no relatives or nothing. Again, telling you that this guy is completely by himself. And he knows that his entire future is just more loneliness until he dies. He says, they'll can me pretty soon. He's getting so old and with his crippled arm, he's not even going to be able to work. And he says, pretty soon, I won't have no place to go. And then after he George joins George and Lenny's dream, he tells Curly's wife that things have changed, that he's not this lonely, abandoned guy anymore. He says, we got friends. That's what we got. So it, Candy joins in with this idea of the dream also, not to have a land, but to have these connections and to have these families. In many ways, Crooks is the most isolated character on the barn. This is the 1930s, and the racial discrimination was intense. Crooks was not allowed to stay in the bunkhouse with the other guys. Um, and on top of being black, he also has uh, a crippled back. So he's got this physical disability, as well as the racial discrimination that's playing against him here. And he says, you know, what would you think it was like? Suppose you didn't have nobody. He even tells a story about growing up, about how there just weren't any other, there's like maybe one other black family that he ever even met, that he's just sort of out of place here. And the guys use him as entertainment on Christmas Day to bring him in and beat him up um, as what they're going to spend their time doing. But they won't let him join in any of their games here. Yeah, no, little Rudolph. Um, he says, I can't play cards with them because I'm black. They say I stink. 
Instead, he has this solitary room in the barn where no one goes in. There's even this moment when Slim stops in to actually ask him a question, and all Slim does is just kind of puts his head into the room. He won't actually step into Crooks's space. And he tells Lenny, when Lenny shows up bored, saying, I ain't wanted in the bunkhouse and you ain't wanted in my room. And ironically enough, Lenny, who is isolated because of his disability, because of his developmental challenges, doesn't see the racial issues with Crooks. And he actually is happy to befriend Crooks. He doesn't, a lot like little children, he doesn't see race and color at this point. He's never been taught this or hasn't been smart enough, I guess, to learn it, unfortunately, from the examples in the society around him. And Crooks spends his time reading books. He says, I need company, I need something to think about. But he says, books ain't no good. A guy needs somebody. He says, I tell you, a guy gets too lonely and he gets sick. This idea that we are social beings, that we need this kind of companionship, or we have physical consequences to this. Now, from the moment Steinbeck introduces Curly's wife, we know that she doesn't fit in. Um, she's only, the only girl that we see in the entire story, except for that little mention of the girl in Weed and maybe, you know, Susie's place down at the, the, the prostitution house. But she's in the wrong clothes. She's too dressed up for this ranch. She has the wrong attitude. And interestingly enough, in case you haven't figured this out yet, she's never given a name. The only thing they ever refer to her as is Curly's wife, as though she's not a person of her own. The only thing they think about is that her a relationship with Curly, that she's Curly's possession. She's this thing that belongs to Curly. She's not her own person. And she is always coming around saying, I'm looking for Curly. But everybody, including the bunkhands, know she's not really looking for Curly. She's just lonely. She's looking for company. The guys, of course, see it as flirting and as dangerous because if Curly finds out they're, they're talking to his wife, that he's going to take after them. But really, she's just looking for anybody, for any kind of company. She says, think I don't like to talk to somebody every once in a while? Think I like to stick in that house all the time? And we find out that in the scene where she hangs out with Crooks and Candy and Lenny, because she says, they ain't nobody else. There, there's nobody else there in that house. Everyone else has gone into town. She's completely alone. And there's some implied abuse by Curly. We know that he's really controlling. We know he's got a quick temper. Uh, she describes how he took his, her records and broke them, and this was the only entertainment that she had. And of course, he would be perfectly happy to just keep her locked up in the house all the time. And she even tells us that she only married Curly, ironically, because she was trying to escape from this kind of isolation. She wanted to get away from home and her mother, but now she feels even more isolated than before. She says, I never get to talk to nobody. I get awful lonely. Now, Lenny should be one of the outcasts, and in a lot of ways he is. We know that he has this developmental disability, that his IQ is that of a very small child, that he's really not very smart, um, what we would have called retarded in a, in a previous age. But because he's got George, he has this kind of family relationship. So George and Lenny together are different. George is not like all of these other guys in these other itinerant ranch hands, but together they have a family. He says, we got somebody to talk to that gives a damn about us. And the dream that they have of this little house and this piece of land really isn't about owning a piece of property. It's about creating a home. It's about the concept of self-determination that they would get to decide in the morning if they get up, what time they get up, and if they're going to work that day or not. And that idea of living off the fat of the land means living off of their own work and sweat and not doing the work and sweat for someone else who will take all of that money. And that they have somebody, you know, they'll have friends. They can invite people to come and join with them. It's theirs. They can create this family, this community. We get a little bit of the backstory on Lenny and George. We find that George began to tease Lenny when they first met, but now he's very protective of him. And Lenny, of course, is 100% sure of George's friendship and trusts him completely. When we get to the end of the story and we see that George's decision to kill Lenny here, that it's made out of love. He, um, Steinbeck has set us up with the story of Candy and Candy's dog, and George now will not make Candy's mistake of letting some stranger shoot his friend. If Curly actually caught up with them and shot Lenny, it would be done out of anger. Curly's even trying to to, wants to shoot Lenny in the most painful way possible, but George knows that Lenny is his responsibility and that he needs to be the one in this terrible situation where there really isn't another choice, not unlike, again, Candy and his dog, that Lenny has to die. George is going to be the one to make sure that he does it. And he tries to make sure that Lenny's last moments are happy. He's describing the house and the rabbits. He tells Lenny to look across the river and says, let's get to that place now. 
And then the novel has this kind of uncertain ending. We're fairly sure that George is giving up the dream. I mean, I suppose he could go get the house still and, you know, keep working. But you get this idea that without Lenny, George has now gone back to being one of those guys that don't have anybody. And the dream was always about being together. It was never about the land. It was about having this sense of an escape from this loneliness and isolation. And so that's the end. I hope that you've seen some of the ways that this theme of being lonely and being isolated or separated from everyone else has played out in several characters and events across the novel of Mice and Men.